Welcome to this episode of Energy Radio, a podcast by CEM Engineering with the goal of giving you the knowledge and the tools and the power to manage your energy. Welcome to Energy Radio. This is our opportunity to talk about your energy challenges and uh, how we can help you. So today's uh, conversation is fun. We have with me on my uh, left, Pascal Robichaud, our Director of Co-Generation, and on my right, Dave Rorda, all the way from Calgary for this, live and in person, our Director of Western Canada. And um, aside from being great guys um, and know how to have fun, you both worked uh, at a common place briefly for the same time. So today's conversation, I wanted to put Pascal and Dave in a room and just hear uh, old war stories about your time at Westinghouse. So that's what today's about. I'm sure we'll have some laughs. And, uh, but more importantly, I think they were formative times in your career. So uh, I, w- well, I want to hear a bit about that and you guys can swap stories. And so maybe Dave, I'll start with you. Kind of walk me through the particulars of, of how you come to Westinghouse, um, you know, some of the w- what work you were doing, what your role there was you know, like and that kind of stuff. Sure. Well, I was in uh, fourth year university uh, studying electrical engineering. I uh, was looking for a job like my colleagues, and it was. What school were you at? Not that it's relevant. But. Sure. I was at University of Waterloo. Okay. Um, just sort of down the road from Westinghouse Canada, which was in Hamilton. Um, so I actually thought I was going to end up in the oil and gas industry, but just due to sort of economic times, uh, I ended up applying to Westinghouse just out of an ad. I think it was in the Toronto Star. Okay. Just uh, applied to this. Uh, job it was called field service engineer didn't really know much about it but it sounded like it involved uh, turbines generators and, and international travel and that all sounded very appealing to me uh, just being sort of 22 years old in school so I applied uh, through the Toronto Star and about a month later I was uh, I called for an interview went down to Hamilton had a uh, the, you know the interview started pretty normally it sort of did uh, interviewed with HR and uh, and uh, my, the hiring manager for about half an hour but once that was over, we actually spent about uh, two hours sort of walking through the factory, climbing over gas turbines really? in, our, in our business suits. And yeah, That's it was uh, part of your interview. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we. Uh, I think the hiring manager wanted me to really understand what the the job was and show me the facility. And huh. yeah, it was quite a probably one of the longer interviews I've ever been involved in. It was certainly quite different uh, doing that in an interview. So yeah, they. they this was just for a co-op. Term no, this was uh, for a permanent position. Oh, this position. Was a permanent, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, this was in fourth year. Uh-huh. So yeah, about a month, uh, I think it was about a month later, we, it took a while to kind of get a, a job offer, but eventually, you know, that came and uh, that was great. And about three or four months later, I started, I think it was, uh, I started in June or so of uh, 1993. Yeah. And then within about a month, I was out on my, my first assignment, uh, starting up a, a smaller combined cycle plant, gas turbine and steam turbine combined mm-hmm. cycle plant in Albany, New York. Or was the steam turbine Westinghouse as well? Uh, it was MH, uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, which oh, okay. is, a, I think they were, a, they were a different company, but they, they were doing jobs together at okay. the time. Was, okay. They were a licensee of Westinghouse uh, technology, I believe, at the time, right? Yeah. Or maybe that oh. came after, but. Yeah, we actually had an engineer from Japan on the job, so uh, okay. in, uh, in Albany. So they send you out fresh out of school, wet behind the ears, like send you with, with like, how do they do that? They just send you out in the deep end of the swimming pool or what does that look like? Oh, uh, you're, so there was a, another engineer, electrical engineer on the job with okay. a couple of years experience. So it was okay. on the job training, basically, I guess he'd call it under, under a mentor. Okay. okay. Uh, sort of as the job progressed, I started doing some night shifts and so on, but that was, uh, no, it was a ex- fairly extensive commitment to some on the job training. Okay. Wow. That they would do. And, and your focus was, I mean, it's a big scope <coughs> on an engine like that, but your 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 focus was a subset of that? Or like, what were you power systems? Were you controls? Were you... Yeah, that particular job, I think uh, Westinghouse scope was primarily the distributed control system and then the two prime movers, the gas turbine okay. and the steam turbine. So okay. we were uh, responsible, even at the loop check level, to, uh, well, first of all, to help them construct the engine. So it's... You know, you know, directing the contractor what to, uh, helping them locate what had to be terminated where and keeping an eye on the quality of the uh, of the construction and then later on uh, verifying uh, you know everything was wired up correctly coming from the factory and then the field wiring and then okay. eventually powering and commissioning everything and actually you know eventually um, 
you know, lighting off combustion in the gas turbine for the first time and, okay. and uh, admitting steam to the steam turbine for the first time. Wow. So it was all, it was, you know, just a tremendous opportunity for someone coming out of yeah. school to see all that. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah. What about you, Pascal? What's your story of ending up at Western Hills? So uh, I started out in field service and uh, I ended up staying throughout the late 90s and to the point where um, I, I guess I left just shortly after Westinghouse Canada got acquired by Siemens. Okay. Um, so yeah, speaking of formative experience, um, that was it for me. Uh, you know, what it was for me is that I always had a specialization in thermodynamics okay. um, in university. So by the time I got the interview for Westinghouse, for me as a mechanical engineer, it was the closest thing to being a rocket scientist uh -huh. in terms of you know having the rock star job. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was um, it was quite interesting to be able to continue in that field and actually to grow from there. So obviously it was a field service job at the time, and uh, so you got you got to have the uh, the hands-on experience. Of knowing what a gas turbine is and um, and uh, and figuring out how it gets put together, you know, it's a pretty complicated piece of technology. Um, but when you actually get into taking it apart and um, and 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 looking at the details of how what an engineer needs to do to keep it running and, yeah. and maintain it properly, um, it's actually it actually turns out to be fairly simple because there's only really one rotating part. Mm. So anyways, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a great experience to have there. Uh, to this day, you know, over 20 years later, I'm still involved in the exact same field that I was, even though now I'm in consulting, I'm not in field service anymore, but it was definitely uh, a huge stepping stone for me into defining my career where I'm at today. Now, I'm intrigued by, uh, and maybe you have some perspective on, like Westinghouse came to you guys as engineers, like I think when I think of field service individuals, I don't necessarily think of a degreed engineer. Do you have a sense of like were your peers also degreed engineers? Like were there other folks who were technicians on the like? How did that? It just I, when I've heard your stories before, it struck me as odd that they're pulling straight out of engineering school for you know a field what I believe to be a field service role. I think, I think that's a level of um, expertise that our supervisors were having at the time. They wanted to make sure that they had the best of the best to basically okay. be out there in the field and to wow. carry out that work. Yeah, yeah. I think a couple things come to mind. I think, uh, you know, obviously coming out of university, we were EITs, but certainly on sure. the way to becoming uh, professional engineers, yeah. uh, I think at, at that time, and I think it's true of a lot of different companies, is uh, field service... Uh, was how engineers would start their career, and and ideally the the thought was you proceed on into design engineer and other, you know, roles within the within the company. I mm. certainly know, uh, you know, many people that I worked with uh, back in those days that are in very senior positions within Siemens, which was uh -huh. you know, they acquired the okay. Westinghouse, but also in uh, companies like GE and and you know uh, you know other industries not necessarily power related, but it was. Uh, so it, it was a first step to a trajectory within the company. Yeah, I think that's part of it. To, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of you also remember back at, you know, it, it, it was a while ago. They were not, uh, we certainly didn't have internet connectivity or cell phone connectivity. So I think part of the philosophy was to send out uh, engineers who could make decisions about, uh, you know, effectively changing the design to make it work in the field uh -huh. without necessarily going, having to go back to the design group. Um, it certainly, uh, there were more remote locations. Like you could, be, my first job was in the U.S., but the, you know there are other projects in uh, could be in Africa or Indonesia, and it, you know you couldn't necessarily pick up the phone and talk to design engineers. So right, right. They wanted to have uh, people in the field that uh, could apply a bit of uh, theoretical knowledge and make okay. you know safely make decisions about uh, in the field without necessarily go back to head office. I think that's something that sort of changed in the last 20 or 30 years of field service where you can actually you know literally pick up a phone and talk to somebody from anywhere i see yeah i mean even email back then was challenging because it was in the world of dial-up uh-huh right. so you basically most times you had to wait to go back to the hotel and actually download your emails and send emails sure. back so yeah wow. it was fa it was actually faxes we used the first couple of years wow. yeah so what, what's the furthest, uh, you mentioned some remote sites, like where's the furthest you guys would go? 
Yeah, I think that may be something else that's changed. Uh, I think, you know, I, I went to uh, Asia, so that's probably about as far away as it go. I worked in Indonesia, spent uh, time in Korea, um, Thailand. Wow, cool. Uh, there were individuals doing jobs in Africa, the Middle East. Uh, myself, I worked in South America as well, so it was international. And uh, Western Coast in Canada had, a, you know, had their own product line, their own design group, and they marketed that the 251 gas turbine and other products worldwide. Okay. So consequently, our we followed that product line worldwide. I, see. I, see. Uh, I think I, I think now with Siemens, it's probably a little bit more regional. That if it's a job in Asia, they probably you know as a first the first thing they do look for someone in Asia to support that. I right. don't think they do quite do the international travel that mm. that we had the opportunity to do. What about you, Pascal? You the same thing all over the place? Uh, uh, for me, it was a little bit different. Um, you followed the path of the 251. Uh, for me, I kind of fell in the groove of servicing 501 um, engines. Like the, uh, the, the small ones that Martin used to sell? No, it's actually the, no, that, that, that would be the 501 KB5, but these would be the 501 D5s and the 501 Fs, the, okay. larger, the okay. larger class machines that Westinghouse had. Okay. So their fleet was quite significant in North America, so I kind of lucked out, so to speak, by staying in North America by servicing these engines. I see. For the most part. Yeah. I spent some time in in South America as well. Yeah. But uh, I, I kind of, you know, you know, relatively speaking, I've considered myself lucky to not not having to go to those difficult places to do that kind of work. Yeah, yeah. So Now, how does it, you know, you both have wives and, and you know, kids now. How did that work? Like, did, did, was this all before, you know, getting married and having kids or? That was, yeah, that definitely was... Definitely before. For me, it was definitely before, <laughs> yeah. and it was actually... The reason I, I decided not to pursue that career path anymore was exactly because of, you know, family plans that okay. I, I wanted to take on, so... Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, it, it, I can't imagine it would be sustainable to, to sustain a family and, and travel the world like that. No, I, I think if you were more involved in the construction side of things where you went somewhere for a year or two you might be able to do it okay. if you uh, were able to move the family right, with that right. kind of thing but uh, yeah. or happen to find a job close to home but yeah generally I would say it would be a tough combination because when, at the time I was in the field uh, depending if it was a combustor job or a hot gas path or a major overhaul the jobs would would range between one week to uh, six weeks roughly and especially in my case, there was lots of instances where I had to leave a site and fly directly to the next one. Wow. So yeah. there'd, be, there'd be long stretches where I'd be traveling away and uh, actually having to rely on, um, on, uh, on friends and roommates back home to actually pack my suitcase for the next season. Kind no of thing. kidding. Wow. Uh, so that had to happen a few times. Yeah. But, I bought uh, a few jackets along the way. Seasons yeah. change yeah. while you're on the job. And <laughs> yeah, that's right. Some clothes. <laughs> So what's the what's the, what's some of the crazier things you I mean you, you you're out there you you've probably seen some crazy stuff over the years or you've had to deal with crazy stuff and sure any stories come to mind? Yeah, I guess just as far as living accommodations go, probably one of the crazier things I did was I, I was working in Central Colombia, down like in South America, back in the late '90s when there was still a, you know effectively a civil war. There was uh, um, guerrillas that were uh, battling a couple different guerrilla groups. Uh, still battling the government. It was this project was literally in, uh, I'd say, a, a fairly sh- an area where the grills had a lot of dominance. So the the plant, I think it was about maybe ten kilometers outside of the uh, the center that we were staying in, and it was it definitely was not safe to drive the roads. So they flew us uh, in a helicopter every day to work. So if we wow. we were staying in a compound and sort of an armed compound. We had bodyguards. Um, and then we flew to the plant and you know landed just outside the plant uh, with our you know with the our security folks um, and, and you know we'd spend the, the, the day working at the plant we didn't definitely didn't stay there at night and actually the Colombian army had a you know a security presence around the plant as well so that was and we never actually never had any problems but we certainly took lots of security precautions on that job and yeah looking back that was a Different, for sure, taking a helicopter to work every day because it wasn't safe to do it any other way. I mean, we go to site now and we have, we have to do a safety plan. I mean, that's, that's, like, <laughs> yeah, so that's right. totally different, right? Try to fill that one out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah for me, uh, I also went to Colombia, but uh, 
I lucked out that the job site I was at was in the city. Mm -hmm. So I still had an armed escort, but wow. the power plant itself had guard towers on each end with, you know, heavily fortified personnel, you know, keeping watch. And actually, and just to, it, it's quite wonderfully, the the situation in Columbia is much, much better the last, even the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and if I look back at some of the yeah. city I stayed later on in Cowie, it's just thriving because they, they have come to a, uh, a peace, as I understand it, with the guerrillas. Another area I did work in Venezuela um, has unfortunately gone, gone the other way. It's right. much, much less uh, stable than point. it was when, yeah. when we were working there. Good point. Yeah. What about the, what about you know technical stuff? Like you're out there in the field, you're totally on your own. You must have, you know, MacGyver comes to mind. Like he must have had to deal with some stuff. Yeah. Um, one of the most nerve-wracking things as a as a mechanical gas turbine field service guy, especially working on large frame units, uh, when it comes time to pull a rotor mm. out of a casing, you know, given that uh, that these rotors weigh, it's basically tons and tons of stainless steel that you have to pull out with a crane. It's a precision lift, and um, <clears throat> when you understand that some of the clearances around some of these compressor blades are within thousands of an inch. Um, even the most seasoned field service guy, he's got his heart racing when the when the rotor gets pulled up because you're relying on the expertise of the crane operator. Uh, you have you have um, you know six to twelve guys around the rotor to try to guide it as it comes out and wow. keep in watch. It's uh, it's a very very stressful time. Huh. Um, you know nothing's ever happened to any of the lifts that I was participating in, but um, obviously there's horror stories out there. It's like. Uh, of rotors bouncing in bearings because there's a flexibility in the crane, for example. So it's all those things you have to worry about, you know, picking up the right uh, balancing point on the uh, lifting beam, making sure that you've put the saddles in the right spots. Yeah. Because once you start lifting this thing, it just goes wherever it wants and there's no turning back, right? Yeah. Once you, you once you lift it and you have a point of imbalance, there's, there's very little recovery you can do. So oh. that's an example of stuff that we had to do in the field that you know you kind of you, re you really have to make sure that you're doing it right wow. and it's a stressful uh, stressful yeah. thing to do yeah. but other than that like you said it was all fun yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it was certainly uh, I don't know if the MacGyver type stuff was involved but certainly uh, in, in the time I was in the field and I think the same for Pascal it was the early days of uh, F technology F, F firing temperatures for, for okay. Westinghouse and okay. I think also for GE and other firms um, but it was also the early days of dry low NOx okay. technology, okay. particularly on uh, dual fuel. And that was certainly uh -huh. uh, tons of challenges. Uh, with liquid fuel, um, we would have uh, trouble with purging. To, you know, we would have uh, fuel nozzles coking up on us. We would have trouble making the emissions numbers. You know, it, it, the OEMs have long since resolved these problems, yes, but yes. Uh, on kind of on the cutting edge of it in a on a job, it was uh, you know very stressful times trying to make that stuff work, but also very satisfying when you did sort of figure it out yeah, uh, yeah. in the field. Yep. Huh. Uh, fuel oil, it's uh, you know you get a leak, you can have fires and things happen. I've had a few of those, but nothing too crazy. But it's uh, uh, I think the only MacGyver thing I can think of, we did sometimes use um, vice grips just to position the, the igniter to find the right igniter position, okay. uh, kind of the insertion depth into the transition. We'd sometimes use a Vice grips just to temporarily hold those in place until okay. we could uh, figure out where it was. But that's the only. Did you have it on your check sheet? It was a line that said remove vice grips. It didn't, <laughs> get, didn't get made in your process, did it? Yeah. No, and and uh, probably a few trips to Radio Shack to to get the right resistors uh -huh. for various boards. Uh, it's yeah. probably all programmable now, but sometimes we had to change resistors on things. And, and did, did your balance uh, or did your scope include like you know synchronizing breakers and stuff? Like you're you're doing all the. Yeah, we would ab absolutely be the ones in charge of uh, synchronizing the generator for the first time. And then, you know, to do that property, you, you, you do have to make some pretty extensive checks. And there was a couple of uh, projects where we brought the generator up to synchronize and the uh, the rotation, the electrical rotation of the generator was incorrect. So it's, wow. uh, we, uh, I was, you know, had to never say, we're not synchronizing today. We right. got to, we right. had to fix this. So never, never close out a phase, obviously. No, that'd be yeah, certainly. That's it'd one of a few things you don't want to do. It'd yeah. be career, career limiting. <laughs> things, I think. He wouldn't yeah. be here to talk yeah. about <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> you guys ever work a job together? Like, did your careers, your illustrious careers, overlap? 
think they did, right? Yeah, well, when it, actually it was the first time I ever went to the field. Um, so my supervisor took me to to, to, to Cardinal where uh, there was a 501 there and, and Dave happened to be there servicing okay. the unit at the okay. time. So our paths crossed for probably a weekend, I would okay. say. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, after that, and that's the thing too, with everybody else working, you know, there was probably, what, 12 people in your group on the electrical side? Yeah, that sounds about right. Maybe may likely the same on the mechanical side. We'd be floating around, like scattered all around the world. It was, it was rare when we actually crossed paths right, again. Right. It was, okay. uh, it was, uh, yeah. You didn't have a company barbecue or Christmas party where everybody was there. Well, if, if we did, there'd only be two guys showing up yeah, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the other 30 are out in the, in the sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Certainly lots of time in the field where if you were, you know, working on a job together, especially in a foreign country, you would spend uh, all kinds of time with yeah, each other, like, working and eating and, yeah. you know, it's, uh, yeah, and even uh, Pascal mentioned Cardinal, there's certainly people uh, that worked at Cardinal that I still uh, interact with professionally, there's, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there's lots of, uh, you know, field engineers, you know, that have moved on to other companies and places and stuff, and uh, yeah. Yeah. those are still the uh, colleagues I tend to, uh, you know, have dinner with when I get the chance. Actually, just last night I had dinner with a with a fellow that I I trained uh, at one point oh, as cool. a field engineer. And, yeah. Uh, even the hiring manager ma uh, manager I mentioned that uh, you know, took me around the factory. I have dinner oh, yeah. with him in Edmonton when I get the chance. Oh, as well. neat. Okay. Yeah. So, are there elements of your what you do today that have been influenced by that? Like you know, aside from having dinner with with folks, like are there certain elements of you know engaging with clients or working on projects where you think. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I think, think that's formed by my Westinghouse time. Yeah, I think uh, certainly as a younger engineer, a couple things you learned, it's uh, yeah, if you, especially if you're coming into a plant to sort of solve problems, like not every plant was a, a new build. Sometimes you're asked right. to come in to fix something like an auto voltage regulator or a controls issue, but you very quickly you figure out uh, you know, how to gather information from different people in the plants and mm. you know, size up different personalities and... Uh, you know, in the field, when you you get pretty quick feedback on whether your solution was actually uh -huh. actually effective or yeah. not, and it, certainly you get uh, very quick feedback from your customer. Either you know they're they're happy you've solved their problem, or you you sort of get feedback that you haven't solved their problem right, yet. Right. So, uh, great great opportunity to get to kind of get some of those uh, client facing skills or or, right. or you know trial and troubleshooting yeah, skills I figured out. I think it was yeah. you know fabulous. I, it, certainly anybody. Uh, I always encourage any any uh, new engineer or, or really any engineer that wants to uh, you know get more experience and go to the field, whether it be uh, you know commissioning construction. You don't have to sort of travel the world like right. Pascal and I did, right. but uh, right. you know even you know, minor exposure to the field is uh, always a great thing. Yeah, what about you, Pascal? Are there certain elements that you're still bringing yeah. to work every day? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we had to deal with construction crews. We had to deal mm -hmm. with different customers. Um, we had to deal with the pressure of turning around these shutdowns as soon as possible uh -huh. because. You know, and, 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 and to go around all of that, really, we had to, to learn how to plan things out on site, making sure that everything was going to go smooth for the next week or two that your shutdown was planned for. Mm -hmm. So you had to make sure that uh, you kept in touch with your supervisor, which is basically the representative of the construction crew. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is, this is a concept that we're still using today. Right. And understanding how uh, construction crews work, what their interactions are, what kind of advice that do they, they need, you know, how to message to the end user when there's a delay because there's a part that you found that you, there's no replacement part for, you need to go find one or source one. So you also have to learn how to interact with the customer as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously in consulting, that's yeah. the majority of what we do. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's all the customer focused part of what we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, um, you had to learn that on very early on. Yeah. And um, so, um, yeah. Do you, like, you know, these are formative experiences. We have other folks on our team that, you know, travel the world commissioning boilers. And, but I'm not, do you think that, there are people that are still doing that, or is it a is it a lost art in terms of you know the arc of one's career to start you know in the field service and then migrate? You know, I, do, I, do, does the next generation have it too easy that they don't have to pay their dues? And 
I would say it's quite rare for someone to stay a field engineer their entire life. Like there's certainly field engineers are still managing field field groups, but right. but actually just four months ago I attended a retirement party in Burlington for uh, um, someone I work with in in Hamilton in the field group, and he he spent his whole career wow. uh, as a field engineer, spent a lot of time uh, in, in the Middle East in particular. Mm. Um, yeah, and I can think of one or two colleagues, former colleagues in the States that did it for their entire career as well. But I would say generally it's, it's quite rare. But I, I don't know if, like we have a lot of great young people here, but I don't know if there are many people going from university to a field service career like you guys do. Like you guys do. Is that still happening, you think? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting... Uh, I, I, I'm really not sure if... Yeah. See, what's happened, I think, is that... Um, the whole industry in general, especially in terms of large field units, um, the large-scale power generation industry has taken a hit since, yeah. since the early 2000s. Because um, here in Canada, uh, our former employer has, um, has disappeared, I think, in the mid-2000s, right? The, that's when the, the main yeah. plant closed in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. That's about right. So in terms of field service here, especially for the large units, I'm not really sure. I, I understand that our field service group has is still around in in a different shape, I believe, in a different uh, under a different uh, umbrella, probably. Uh, I know some of these guys are still around doing the same work, servicing the same engines. Yeah, there's actually more gas large gas turbines in Ontario than there were. Yeah, uh, there's probably uh, I'm not quite sure I know the exact count of Siemens machines, but I think when I started, there was only small gas turbines from uh, Westinghouse and Siemens in in Ontario. Now there's uh, quite a bit more so they may oh. be able to sort of that may help them stay longer to feel that right, they can actually right. work more in Ontario. Yeah, yeah, right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So do you miss it? Do you miss your time in the field? Yeah, I, I certainly miss the travel at times. Okay. Um, yeah. Sort of part and parcel with the travel was a lot of, you know, I did a lot of commissioning so it tended to be, you know, six, seven days a week and that's sort of one of the reasons I ultimately left the field is it was just getting too burnt out. Right. I think one thing that uh, there wasn't as much awareness that back there or self-awareness that, you know, you can't just work two or three months in a row without taking a day off. That, right, right, that Certainly right. They, they don't allow people to do that anymore for good reason. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. So I don't, uh, I guess twofold, I don't, I don't miss the long days, but the, you know, traveling, living abroad was yeah, uh, yeah. interesting. It's certainly, uh, you know, I have... Uh, kids and a family now so it's just it's right. not really in the realm of possibility to do that right. anymore yeah. the one thing that I miss out of it uh, that was that was probably unique to that particular position was the fact that on the site you were pretty much your own boss huh. you but how that being said you were also you, you also had responsibility for completing the work right. so at the end of the day the responsibilities were commensurate with the amount of freedom that you had mm. So that was something that was different. Like for somebody who leaves field service and goes into anything else, especially consulting, um, you know, in consulting really you're working not only for your direct supervisor but also for all the customers that you serve. And over there in the field, it was a little bit different. It felt like uh, you had a lot more control over how things were going. Mm -hmm. And um, but yeah, like I said, uh, you know, the responsibilities had to come with it as well. Yeah, so, yeah. but that's something that that's very unique to that yeah, position. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. This is fun. It was. Uh, I appreciate you guys sharing your, your story and uh, your your history with with Siemens or Westinghouse. Sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, I appreciate everything you guys bring to our team. And I think a lot, a large portion of that is influenced by uh, by your history. So yep. so thank you both for doing something that I think is new for you guys to talk like this on camera and on mic. But I appreciate your willingness to stretch yourselves. And, uh, I think many people will benefit from the stories and yeah, it's fun. So thanks for your interest. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Cool. Awesome.